Welcome to Driven the Job. This is Arvin Ram Krishna, and this is another episode of Ask Arv. We've got a question from another friend of ours. His name is Sam or Sammy. Uh, in fact, we've had a, a couple of questions uh, along the same uh, sort of subject, and it's really revolving around the process of automotive design and how does one uh, start with conceptual design, then bring the automobile to uh, mass production. So what does that process look like? So I'm going to do my best. It's going to be a, a tough question for me to uh, completely give all the details, but I do understand the process. I do understand what some of the things are involved. The other thing I'm going to reference is that for those of you who are very serious about understanding the complete step in the automotive design process is to make sure you pick up the book called H Point. It's an excellent book. It's an excellent book that actually goes through the entire process and uh, will give you a really good understanding and grounding of what's involved in vehicle packaging. Okay, so that said, let's, uh, let's start here. Before any project can begin, it is important to really understand what exactly is the market segment you're trying to design for. Uh, meaning that uh, either you're going to start off with a market segment that's going to cater to a, a certain demographic. That means people that are uh, just buying their first car. Maybe they're from the ages of 16 to 24 or something like that. And then you've got from the 24 to 35 years of age and 35 to 45. And then you got the uh, 45 to 60 years of range and that sort of thing. So there's a market segment that you have to really understand. Uh, and then that market, particular market segment, you have to understand what are the main purposes and the use for the car. Someone that is young may end up wanting to drive a very small car that's fuel efficient because they don't have a lot of money and they don't have a lot of needs. Uh, and people start to get older, then uh, requirements start to change. If you are been a professional, you've graduated and you're working, you may want to go up to a sedan level instead of a compact car. Maybe you want to, uh, depending, of course, on your salary grade. That also uh, has a huge factor on what sort of car you decide to choose because it depends on your affordability. When you get to the stage where you are married and you have children, then maybe the SUV is the, the option because you need a uh, utility vehicle that's going to be able to uh, put a bunch of sporting gear and whether it's soccer and football, it could be hockey, and uh, that market segment has particular needs, especially soccer moms or, or soccer dads that have to shuffle their kids around. They want that flexibility. They want to be able to take long trips. Uh, they want to be able to take a vehicle that is sizable, that they can enjoy when they're driving and uh, taking road trips. So that plays into a different factor as well. If you're in your 50s, well, maybe comfort and luxury is going to be your thing. It's, that's how Cadillac caters to their group. Cadillac and Lincoln, they're all known as luxury vehicles. Audi, BMW, Lexus, they all uh, have a certain predefined demographic, and they have a pretty dedicated following uh, with people who purchase those types of cars. So for the BMW, it might be more of the driving experience and performance coupled with uh, luxurious features inside the vehicle. Same thing with Lexus. Everybody, all these companies like Lexus and uh, Infinity, they're kind of trying to catch up to the European brands that have that performance in mind. So before you even start any theme sketches or conceptual sketches, none of that makes even sense until you understand what are the core objectives of the vehicle you're trying to design to. And core objectives basically are the functional objectives. What function does it serve? So you really have to understand who is your audience? Who is your customer? Where is the customer driving this vehicle? What uses does this customer have for this particular kind of vehicle? These sort of projects or these briefs are, are pretty well defined by the instructor. If you're going to a private institution, uh, for automotive design, you better believe that your instructor is going to go through all these functional objectives because that's going to be the basis of your project, the beginning point of your project. Otherwise, you're just not going to know what am I sketching to, what am I supposed to ideate to. Let's talk about customer requirements. What are some of the customer requirements 
when it comes to choosing a vehicle? Well, there's cost for one example, right? And we were talking about that a little bit earlier was if you're just graduating from college and you are getting your first job, then perhaps you may not buy something like a $50,000 car. You may not buy a BMW unless you graduate and you've got uh, a really good uh, starting salary. Uh, it, again, it depends. And, and that also looks at uh, image. So you've got cost and image factors. Maybe there's a certain kind of image you're trying to portray. Uh, other people are looking at, well, how many people can I sit in my car? How many friends can, can come into this vehicle with me if we're going on a trip or something like that? Other people want something that's very sporty. They don't care about all that. They want it, or they don't care about how much back room uh, that they have in the second seat or second row. They just care about getting something that is fast. And so for them, it's handling. It is something that's sporty, something that accelerates, something that is fast that might be important. Then there's flexibility. Does the vehicle, does it allow me to do many different things? What is kind of like the best all around vehicle? Maybe a sedan, a sports sedan is something better than a coupe for them. So these are all things that people have to really think about or designers really need to think about when they are given a project brief that says, hey, we're gonna now develop a sport utility vehicle because this market segment is looking for flexibility and they're looking at comfort, spaciousness, looking for a vehicle that can handle itself really well in bad weather. These are all characteristics that people are going to be looking for when they're buying a sport utility vehicle. And oh, by the way, I am oversimplifying all this stuff, okay? Just for the sake of, of trying to give you just an overview of what all this stuff means. There's so much more detail to each one of these particular areas that it's mind-boggling as it would be because when you design a car I mean it's going to be a pretty complicated process there's so many people that are involved in this the other factor that affects a design is also geography exactly where is the vehicle being sold this gets really complicated because what happens is that automotive companies they'll do their market research they have to make sure that they come up with solutions that work in several of these different states so let's just say for a sport utility vehicle, for example. Well, somebody who buys a sport utility vehicle, let's say in California, is going to get quite a few bells and whistles than somebody that is living in Portland, Oregon, or Washington, or some or Colorado, or some of these states where they would really utilize all these features from a sport utility vehicle. Other people who buy sport utility vehicles may just like the ride height, right? You have uh, CUVs, which are the crossover vehicles that are kind of the hybrid between a full-size sport utility vehicle, an SUV, uh, versus a sedan. And they just feel that some of these vehicles are safer for them. That's a, another kind of requirement. But what happens when people are designing these vehicles is that they have to make sure that the crossover vehicle or the SUV vehicle they're designing has enough towing capacity if people want to haul another a trailer and they want to go camping all these things play a big factor so they all have to fit a, a basic necessity that's going to work across all these market segments okay so now that all your functional objectives and your market segment is figured out uh, where the vehicle is uh, going to be produced the geography well now you can sort of have some fun this is where you start to ideate that means you start to uh, look at what are all the re customer requirements and then start to visualize uh, and start to put together the, the story of what are the proportions of this vehicle going to be. So if you've got, let's say, an SUV, then maybe you've got your, your wheelbase that's going to be a little bit longer. If it's going to be a van, it's going to be longer. If it's going to be a sports car, then you got your two and a half wheel spacing wheelbase. You can start to really experiment and explore. You may start to look at cargo. You may start to look at how much space cubic uh, volume do I need for my cargo area and how does that impact design. So you can start to ideate and create all these cool concepts and sketches and then later after you've created all these sketches and these concepts then that's when you start to look at well what is this theme and how well is this theme going to now relate to the market segment 
it's going to give people what they want and this is where designers have to be really careful because sometimes they may want to sacrifice a lot of functionality for something that is very stylish and that might work if you're doing a sports car if you're designing a sports car but if you're designing something that's like a sport utility vehicle and you're not able to get uh, a lot of cubic volume let's say that your market segment is demanding for X amount of cubic volume to be able to store things and fold seats down but because of the styling you're not able to get as much then that's a trade-off that's something that needs to be considered will the market and the people buy that vehicle despite not having enough volume but this precise stage right here once it's all defined is your avenue to go in and do whatever it is that you want because as you get closer and closer to refining everything and nailing down what the final package is going to be you're not going to be able to go back to that particular stage that stage is going to be gone this is really a terrific stage because this is where you get to experiment with how tall the car has to be or how wide it is, how short it might be, how long the wheelbase is. These are all areas that you can experiment and just have a lot of fun exploring those ideas. Then what happens is that as you get a theme that is now nailed down and all the designers drawings are put up on a board and then management comes in and looks at it they say hey I kinda like this 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 and then people go back to the drawing board they create more theme sketches they come back and then they may have another round of critique and say hey let's try to change some of these things and then when they finally have a theme that they really like for the vehicle that's where even more critiques are going to come into play and this is where the ultimate balance has to uh, really be worked out between engineering and design so just to before I proceed any further just to sort of recap we talked about the market segment we talked about the customer requirements as they relate to the functional objectives and now we're getting into the actual process of design where we're talking about the ideation phase the next phase we're going to be talking about is packaging so packaging is really big this is where reality kind of sets in and when you start looking at packaging part of packaging also revolves around the vehicle architecture such as the vehicle platform so companies car companies what they typically do especially because they have to look at cost constraints they may master plan a particular platform that that can be used for several different market segments so you may have a sedan and the platform that the sedan is built on is shared with a crossover vehicle and it makes sense so you don't have to create a completely new body in white and invest all that tooling and all that money to create something that is new when you can actually use something that already exists now using something that already exists causes some other constraints right because now you are constrained to the package of that particular body in white and that's uh, the reality that means now you have to sort of conform you may have a particular wheelbase that has to be the same you may have to have the same uh, engine that's being used on the sedan and using it on the crossover vehicle all those things have to now be considered as you take that theme sketch and then you start to package the requirements around this new or this same or shared body in white or shared platform part of the packaging activity that you will have to work through is now taking the occupants which is pretty much defined by a 95th percentile occupant which means it covers the the height of 95 percent of the population and so when they package protect a 95th percentile occupant in the front row they want to make sure that 95 percent of the population are going to be able to drive it this is the same deal with the second row occupants obviously the requirements are going to be different if someone is in an SUV or designing for an SUV the second row occupants are going to want comfort they're going to want to be able to have leg room and leg space so that means the volume or the cubic area or cubic volume within the interior vehicle has to be efficient enough to fulfill those sort of requirements not so when you get to a two-door sports car because you are going to be limited in and package constrained so that maybe all that space is really going to be focused and centered around 
the front row occupant that's going to be driving, the front and passenger that's going to be occupying that space. Whereas the, the second row is just not going to have that much space because you have demands of vehicle weight. Uh, you may have demands on uh, gas mileage. Therefore, legroom may not be as important as far as uh, a priority for this particular vehicle. All the packaging studies are typically done with uh, Class A surfaces. What would happen was that once the theme sketches are completed, then they'll start doing preliminary surfaces. Once the theme of the vehicle has been defined and approved and preliminary package studies have been completed, then they'll start to model out uh, a, a Class A surface of the exterior. And then from there, they'll start to refine it. They'll build a clay model out of that. But they'll do this in conjunction with making sure that they're not too far off from the vehicle packaging. It's kind of a, an advanced stage, actually, when this all occurs. And that's just to ensure that whatever the theme that they're coming up with, it's not going to be drastically changed because they didn't properly look at the engineering constraints from the beginning. That said, a lot of the Class A surfaces are done using Alias Wavefront and a lot of the engineering work is done using uh, CATIA. So those are the, the two pieces of software that a lot of these OEMs seem to be using. Unigraphics is also another one. Unigraphics and CATIA, they are a, a heavily math-based modeling system that is used uh, especially for, for production release because they have to ensure that the integrity of the CAD data and the data that is being exported out to potential suppliers to uh, start tooling off of this data is very sound and very robust. And CATIA, Unigraphics, because they are uh, basically a parametric uh, modeling uh, software, it enables them to be able to, to make sure that uh, the tolerances and the the data integrity is secure enough for uh, people to be able to cut tools off of them. Uh, Alias is not as good, but what they do use Alias for is typically to use the surfaces as far as a Class A, but then when you solidify those surfaces, uh, they import those surfaces and then use CATIA to solidify those surfaces and then do all the B-side work, especially for like plastics and things like that. Which brings me to the interior segment of uh, vehicle development. When it comes down to interiors, again, a very, very crucial part of design because the, the market segment that you're designing to, the customers you're designing for, we have to ensure that once you're now in the vehicle and you, the customers love the exterior, they love the design, you're going to be spending most of your time in the vehicle inside of the car itself. So that interaction with your controls, the steering column, the clusters, being able to see the, uh, the navigation screen, being able to utilize the navigation screen, making sure that everything is in the right correct spots things are intuitive that all kind of falls into the interior's packaging so you have to look at the the trim you have to look at the controls uh, the instrument panel you got to look at switches where they located how do they feel uh, are you able to commonize the theme across the board you have to look at uh, reach zones which are also very important because the occupant needs to be able to reach controls. They have to be able to reach the lumbar knob if it has a rotary lumbar knob. It has to be, they have to be able to reach the recliner handle. They have to be able to reach the height adjuster handle. So as the occupant starts to interact with all the different features inside the vehicle, that also plays a vital role to the quality of the interior and how people interact. And that also affects the people's perception of that quality. So these are really important guidelines to start to look at and they get very complicated very fast because there's always trade-offs. You're not going to get everything. You're not going to be able to satisfy every single criteria. But hopefully as you're designing the vehicle, you can at least prioritize and say, well, these people may not need these particular features or they may not need a uh, passenger may not need a lumbar knob because they don't do any 
Uh, they just don't care about lumbar support, for instance, so they may just have a static lumbar. So all these things as far as the, the seats and just interaction with the interior of the vehicle is, is very important. Safety features are also very important when it comes to packaging in the vehicle interior environment. As the government starts to put in more requirements for safety, airbags, and make them mandatory, then those are also things that uh, need to be carefully balanced because you got airbags in the, the trim, such as like the B pillar and uh, possibly even the A pillar, and then you've got your steering wheel, you've got airbags also in your headliner that pop out so just depending on the the vehicle in itself airbags and seats is a big deal you see a lot of vehicles that have side airbags uh, that are packaged within the uh, the bolsters the side bolsters so those are things that you have to make sure that you have enough clearance between the seat and then your hard trim like the B pillar so when you adjust your seat fore aft obviously you don't want to be touching any hard trim powertrain also has a very huge impact on your vehicle packaging and as and also your aesthetic statement when you look at um, let me see let me think of some vehicles the Viper right when you look at a Viper and you look at how large that engine is you can see that the majority of that vehicle is all hood that's because you're trying to package such an incredibly large engine uh, into that uh, particular space because the name of the game for these cars are they're, they're big and they've got a lot of power so the the body and the form language has to sort of communicate that I won't say sort of I keep saying sort of <laughs> they do need to communicate that that form language versus an SUV or a Jeep or a minivan completely different even though they try to make things a little bit sportier uh, looking at that versus uh, a vehicle like the Viper or even the uh, rear engine uh, vehicles like a Ferrari uh, something to that effect they're all different and they all affect the wheelbase and the packaging and how the occupants sit so those are obviously things that need to be considered right up front when you're starting to look at your uh, requirements your functional requirements Wow, there is so much more to cover and I feel like I've just scratched the surface because each one of those segments, like I said, is we can really expand upon that and that could be even separate podcasts. But uh, man, this is just kind of scratching the surface. So I'm going to shorten things up here a little bit and, and just kind of summarize the rest of the stuff on what needs to be done. But during this whole process, and once you find that uh, the package is nailed down, you've got a good balance between uh, vehicle integration and aesthetics then they will continue to refine the product that means there will be certain areas uh, certain stages because you usually have a phase one phase two phase three and a phase four uh, when it comes to designing a vehicle and that will be stretched out those phases will be stretched out uh, for a three-year period of time or a two and a half three-year period during that time frame, the phase one, which is what we were talking about earlier, was going through that phase of ideation and trying to figure out a good theme. But at the same time, during that phase one, they are also looking at the package. Uh, one of the advantages that you get from a cross-platform uh, type of initiative is that you know that the wheelbase and the position of the powertrain are somewhat defined. Uh, there might be some tweaks and things for the vehicle interior, especially when you're looking at, uh, let's say, for example, uh, things that are kind of easy. If you look at a, a Toyota Camry versus a Lexus ES300 or 350, they're essentially the same car, except for the vehicle interior and the exterior. So they have to kind of work within the same confines. But aesthetically, they have the flexibility of making some changes, but at least you know that the packaging and the vehicle position, I'm sorry, the occupant position within the vehicle has to remain relatively the same. I don't know all the, the details of that, but I think those are some of the advantages that you get versus starting from complete scratch and building an entire vehicle. Uh, but of course, building an entire vehicle allows you to have more freedom of defining what that audience is and where that occupant needs to be sitting so you have more flexibility 
uh, as far as starting something with um, a completely a fresh start. As I said, you will end up refining the product. You will go through several vehicle uh, critiques and they will start to evaluate the Class A surface. Uh, the Class A surfaces, once the architecture has already been uh, defined and the powertrain has been defined, they'll continue on with surface work to, to make sure that the, the surfacing and the exterior uh, theme uh, is refined to a point that they get upper management level approval. And then they continue on with that process and once that theme is defined, they will even scan that once they made modifications to the clay model. Uh, you'll have uh, designers that will provide some sketches and then you'll have clay modelers that will go in and carve and interpret the sketches and then once that's been done you will have a scanning process and then that scanned data will be math data that can be then converted into alias so then you'll have another surfacer that takes that data and then refines it because obviously clay model as beautiful as it is it's not perfect so you have to make sure that all the math data is completely redone in alias and create a finished class A surface uh, for release during that process you'll also be working engineers will be working with the stamping experts or the companies or the manufacturers that will actually stamp uh, those sections of the vehicle so you'll have your door panels you'll have your your front fascia which will be molded out of plastic and then you'll have the hood and you'll have your quarter panel the front and rear quarter panel so all those things have to also go through a feasibility design review to make sure that the manufacturer can actually stamp that shape that part so then cost will also come into that play uh, depending on the kind of vehicle that you've got okay I covered a lot of things from the last recap so I'm going to once again recap what we discussed part one was to look at the functional objectives what market are you designing for what is the segment and then that part of that like we had mentioned was looking at geography and looking at the demographic uh, those are all going to be part of the the market segment and understanding what it is the customer in that market segment what are their needs and what do they want so that's uh, part one the second one of uh, part two was the packaging or initial packaging and ideation so here the markets defined, the customers defined, and this stage is basically about the designer being able to go to town and not be completely restricted with the packaging. They're out there, they're theming out the vehicle, creating something interesting that fits the functional objectives and what people want, interpreting that. And then they go through that process of refinement, refining the design and picking a theme uh, so that they can take that theme and then start go to stage three, which is looking at uh, packaging, right? So packaging and going through initial feasibility and making sure that uh, the occupant is positioned in the vehicle. The first row and the second row occupants, their position is defined and then you're looking at clearance zones, you're looking at reach zones, you're looking at is the occupant able to see outside of the vehicle, or I'm sorry, able to see uh, through the windshield, are they able to see when they're backing up, uh, is there any obstructed views, this is a really really huge uh, part of the uh, packaging because this is where the designer starts to learn that his theme may end up needing to change because of all these other requirements and some of those requirements like I said they're they're dictated they're either dictated by engineering or they're dictated by the government where they can't possibly violate uh, certain government uh, restrictions or regulations for safety uh, for example the next section we talked about powertrains and how powertrains also affect the overall packaging and how the occupant sits and as well as the theme but a lot of that is also sort of decided uh, up front with uh, the functional requirements and then lastly was just talking about how the surfaces end up changing the process with which you go through the clay modeling stage to ensure that the theme is being retained or any modifications that are made uh, this stage is also very critical because when you know seeing something in a sketch versus seeing it in CAD 
and then seeing it in real life it really brings a, a whole new dynamic into understanding your surfaces because when you see it in real life they'll end up modeling it beautifully and they'll put this uh, film around the clay so that they can then observe and track the highlights which is uh, really helpful for understanding uh, the theme and just how the light plays off of the surfaces uh, so that activity in itself is something that's somewhat flexible as long as they're probably within the you know few millimeters of change where the the entire vehicle has pretty much been defined and now you're you're looking at stamping and how they attach the the quarter panels are all been defined and all feasible and they can they can afford to to look at uh, the flexibility of the theme a little bit there but all that is is part of the development and they also have to be mindful that as they change surfaces what does that do to the aerodynamics what does that do to vehicle dynamics when you drive all that also plays a key role but part of that activity once the surfaces are done they'll they'll have modeling exercises to understand where the airflow is with the entire vehicle what's the drag coefficient uh, all those are modeled in at that time to to get the optimal uh, amount out of the entire vehicle design. Again, I'm going to reiterate that if you purchase H Point by Stuart Macy, it's an excellent book that really outlines all these functional requirements and packaging in thorough detail. It's a really an amazing resource for any designer that just wants to understand the flow and how things uh, are put together. Just getting that frame of reference and that technical detail is is invaluable. I got to tell you that anybody that takes a strong interest in understanding vehicle design is not just about the aesthetic. There's always going to be trade-offs and I'd have to say that a lot of designers don't really care about those trade-offs and I think that the people in the future that are armed with more information and have a respect for the engineering and have a respect for understanding what those requirements are it makes them a much more powerful designer an efficient designer that can actually speak both sides of the field whether it is engineering and just design but at least maybe not everything about engineering but at least be knowledgeable enough to understand where you can make compromises and bring this product together that's a wrap on driven to draw just a couple things before you go one if you enjoyed this episode and found it useful let me know your thoughts and provide me some feedback on iTunes just click on the link below on the show notes I would sincerely appreciate it it would mean so much to me the second thing is remember that I do believe in you you can be creative if you set your mind to it all you need to do is just try just creating a sketch every single day spending 10 15 minutes a day you're gonna see your skills grow exponentially take that action and try to create that sketch every single day Peace out. I'll see you folks next time on Driven to Draw. Have a good one.